the most important aspect of this role is to make sure that your admissions arrangements are clear, fair and transparent. And looking through your arrangements on an annual basis is vital because you need to agree as a governing board those arrangements on an annual basis. Now, there are a number of things you need to do for that. The first thing you need to do is to need to agree whether you're going to change your PAN, which is your published admission number. Um, most schools do not change their PAN on a regular basis, but you may have some reason why you want to either increase your PAN or decrease your PAN. Now, if you want to do that, you have to consult. You have to consult with, uh, with us as the Board of Education and with the local authority. And it's actually, it's easier to increase your PAN than to decrease your PAN, and I'll just explain why. The local authority has a legal obligation to ensure that there is a, there is a place for every child in the county that wants a place in a primary school. So if schools just start automatically reducing their PAN, saying, you know what, we're not going to take 45 children anymore, we're only going to take 30, the local authority is going to have trouble making sure that there are enough places uh, for each, each child that needs one. So the local authority is keen to ensure that, that, that not too much reduction in PAN, PAN takes place because it takes away their ability to place children into schools. Increasing a PAN, that's sometimes quite a sensible thing to do, particularly in terms of being able to structure class sizes. Um, but one of the responsibilities we have as a Board of Education is that we don't want you to increase the PAN if that is going to add added pressure to your building. Because what we can't do as a Board of Education is you, say, you come to us and say, we've increased our numbers and therefore we need a new classroom or we need an extension or we now haven't got enough toilets. Um, because that's not something that we could necessarily afford to fund through our capital allocations. So say if you are looking at either increasing or decreasing your PAN, you do need to have conversations with us and the local authority. The next thing you need to do in terms of um, your admission arrangements is to determine your oversubscription criteria. Now, you, this oversubscription criteria only comes into play if you are oversubscribed. So if you say, for example, have a PAN of 60 and 55 children apply to your school, then you have to admit all 55. This gets a little bit uh, anxious at times when if you have like a PAN of 60 and 32 children apply and you say, well, actually, I could really do with just keeping a class size of 30 for obvious reasons with key stage one. You can't do that. You need to admit every child up to your PAN that wants a place at your school. So once you're over that number, once you say, you know, if you have a PAN of 30 and you have 55 children that have applied, then you have to scrutinise every child against the oversubscription criteria that you place in your admissions arrangements, which is why those oversubscriptions criteria must align and must agree with the admissions code that has been published for schools. And it's our role as a Board of Education to make sure that those oversubscription criteria are legal and it keeps you safe. So, the first thing in your oversubscription criteria has to be looked after children. That's there in statute and you, you all, all schools um, have those looked after children or, or children on a health healthcare plan as their first criteria. The second criteria, um, there's a debate nationally at the moment about whether siblings should actually be put there as, as, as a second criteria. So right up there, uh, and that's for all sorts of, of family and, and community issues. Um, many of our schools already put siblings up there and it is likely that the next uh, iteration of the admissions code, siblings will be moved up there and almost statutorily put in there as the next criteria. After that, it's for the schools to decide whether they want to put church criteria in there, and that depends on the context that you, you are in. And if you do want to put church criteria in there, what that looks like. Are you looking at specific churches? What kind of patterns of attendance are you looking at? Are you looking at, at weekly, at fortnightly, for a year, for two years? And that's, a, and that's a discussion for you to have in your governing board. Once though you have decided that you want to add, what you want to put church criteria in there, we do have a set form of wording that we uh, that we insist that you use to make sure that you remain compliant within your your admissions code. Again, if you want to put locality in there about children and parents living within the parish boundary, that's absolutely fine for you to put in there. 
Um, again, we have a set form of wording that, that, that we want you to use for that, and you have to make sure that any boundaries that you use are well publicised and easily accessible for any parent that may be applying for uh, a place in the school. The final criteria in all this is you, you have to put just down any other children. Um, there is a, a there is a, a, a catch-all, if you like, in that in each category it's about distance from school. So again, we just encourage you to make sure that you put that in there. The Board of Education does provide um, model uh, admissions arrangements, um, and which which kind of does all the wraparound things in admissions arrangements to make sure that you are you are safe and legal against the admissions code. Um, it's those it's that oversubscription criteria which gives you as a governing board as admissions authority some flexibility but we ask that you work with us as a as a board of education to make sure that what you've decided and why you've decided it are phrased and presented in a way that remain that that ensures that you remain compliant against the admissions code.